Today is November 15, 2020. My name is Cesar Coronado. I'm interviewing a first responder for the University Library Special Collections and Arches at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is partnership with the Voices of Oral, Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please note, officer, that this interview will be placed in the University's Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The, the, the University Library Special Collections and Archives will, will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record your cons consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Uh, do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in the copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Arches to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Arches consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of Pandemic Oral History Minute project, which will include posting the interview on the on the internet? Uh, yes, I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in, in a secure Voices server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before Voices sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have we would have stripped out any contact information for yourselves uh, or family members, so that will not so that will not be a part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes. Uh, the sixth one. On occasions, on occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices uh, receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Uh, no, I do not. No, okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories mean a lot to to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward for what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. Um, okay, so officer, thank you for your time. Your stories and experiences are valuable to us at the UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voices Project. Particularly for us at the UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserve the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley and those who work closely with these populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because you are a first responder and essential worker, I consider you a great candidate for the Voices of Pandemic project. Um, ¿Sí me sí. Okay. Um, so this is the first question. Uh, well, before I start, uh, 
or I ask anything uh, to share uh, your experiences about your life in this pandemic, uh, can you tell us who you are and like what you do? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I work as a first responder in the Austin or Central Texas area. Um, I am from a Mexican, I do come from a Mexican American family and origin. So um, this is, a, I believe this, this project is a, it's meaningful to the Mexican American community. Cool. Okay, uh, so the first question I want to ask you, when did you first hear about COVID-19? Or how did you learn about it? Like through the radio, TV, social media, et cetera. I, I remember hearing it for the first time uh, on the radio. I was actually heading to work and I was listening to the, to the news on the radio and I heard about um, some cases, that, early cases that have, have, had happened in, uh, in China and in all those countries. And I remember thinking about it and, and some commentators were commenting how it was, it was just uh, like a simple cold and, and things like that, which obviously it was not. And, but I do remember specifically hearing it in the local news as well, um, how there was some cases, but they weren't expecting it to get um, to get to the other side of the world to us um, as as it did. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, it really was. Um, okay, so the second question is, what was your first reaction to the information about COVID nineteen? The first, my first reaction again, it was it was really really early, and uh, I believe it was around um, maybe it was late February, maybe early March. Uh, but I remember thinking about it and just uh, wondering, right, if if it was anything anything too crazy or if it was just something uh, uh, something more simple. But um, I I don't I don't recall too many details on on what I thought about it than just uh, I knew it was new and we didn't know much about what, what really was going on. Um, and at what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event? I think I remember um, hearing the first cases and then just days later, um, I remember hearing through the news there were more cases in other countries and then Obviously, like a week or two later, there was more um, in other countries. And then I, I think when I first, when I initially thought it was, this was going to be something pretty serious is when um, we initially started hearing about countries locking down and flights being canceled to certain areas and, and all those uh, initiatives. And I think that's when I, I thought about it and I realized, well, I don't think I've, in my lifetime, I don't think I've heard of that happening before, so I realized that it was it was not as simple as as it sounded at first. Um, so over the last few months, what news, media, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep uh, you informed about coronavirus? So I really I, I use uh, the internet a lot, so I. When I want to know, you know, instant news, what's going on, I just, you know, go to the search engine and uh, search for news uh, in my local area, and um, I typically look for uh, coronavirus updates. Right, that's what we usually look at to see if anything has drastically changed or more information has been given. But um, that's usually that's that's the main way that I look at the news um, regarding coronavirus just because it's 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 in my phone and I can just look it up and know right away. Um, can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease? Uh, and as well, can you share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus? That's a really great question. Um, what what I do understand, so I, I definitely understand that it's, it's a serious matter and that it has affected not only our community here in Texas, but has affected the whole world, right? And I, I do understand that it's a respiratory, um, uh, that affects the respiratory system, this virus, and 
that is highly contagious. Um, as of now, that I know, it's it, it cannot be treated, um, and there, you know, the governments are trying to look for ways to find a solution for it, a vaccine. And there's you know there's rumors of there being a vaccine and all these different things, but uh, um, that that is I think that's a part that I would like to know more about this. Uh, this virus is really understanding how quickly we could find a solution or um, something to prevent for more people to um, be damaged and, and all these families losing their loved ones for sure. Okay, so would you take the first COVID-19 vaccine available on the market? Why or why not? <laughs> this is a good question. I I given a lot of thought to this, and you know I I've, I've read some articles both sides right. There's there's some articles mentioning that it's it's a good thing to do it, and articles that are kind of countering that and and saying that it's it's not a it wouldn't be safe to do it this this soon. I in my it, this is my personal opinion, obviously, but I think I think I I don't think I would do the first round of vaccinations. But I would like to, I would like to do more research and do um, look into it more um, by myself so that I can I can learn more about it before I actually do it. But I I mean I think it's a great thing if we were to get a vaccine for that and, and have something ready. I think it would be a great thing. It, my in my personal opinion, I think I would just try to learn more about it and and uh, before I do anything anything else before I actually take it. And uh, last question before I start on the on the questions I made. Um, do you do your family hold the same beliefs as you about COVID nineteen, or are there some members who take it more seriously or lightly? Um, there's there's definitely a. I mean, I mean, within a family, there's multiple generations, right? And I think. I think there's you can see the whole spectrum there. I have family members who are older and they think it's all kind of made up by the government and you know it's just a a way of uh controlling the people and you know I mean that's their opinion and that's their views and um there's some uh superstition superstition about it too and um that people people uh, fall into that as well but uh, I, we definitely have the whole spectrum there's there's the younger generations who are definitely more engaged in in doing research and learning and and, uh, and really trying to understand the the severity of this and i think they are the ones who are mostly um, um, more aware and and doing their part to to help the community stay stay safe you know um okay um to start off uh tell me about your family uh who do they include and where do they live so i have family in in different areas in texas um i have family in the central area around austin area and i have uh, family in the south um south central area the the ut the rgv right and uh, they live in Hidalgo County, and up here we live um, in the central Austin area. So that includes my parents, uh, my spouse, uh, my children, and my siblings. And I, we all have been uh, affected in some way or the other um, because of this coronavirus, either either by you know things that have been shut down or closed, and or just even family members who have lost their jobs and been laid off right due to mm -hmm. the complications that have come from from this uh pandemic um well like to talk a little bit more about that can you share with me some family activities you used to do in pre-pandemic times and like now you don't do anymore yeah um it had become pretty pretty uh pretty common that we would go to the to the island south padre island down in uh the southeast uh, coast of uh, um, of Texas, and we that that was becoming pretty pretty consistent. And I think due to this uh, pandemic, it's been more of a 
um, a cautious thing to not go and, and do those things. Uh, traveling, we used to travel a lot and, and visit each other, and that has decreased a little bit too due to you know curfews and, and other complications that have come from from the pandemic. Um, well, yeah, like I guess like more Latino families uh, have the culture like to have family gatherings. Um, yeah. Especially the weekends, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> I think something that comes a lot with the Latino culture is uh, we, I mean, we, we, we're we engaged in religion, right? And we like to go to church on Sundays. And I think that's something that has a lot of churches have closed and uh, turned their services into virtual services, right? So I think that's something that has, that has changed and going there and having that social aspect of church and, and being able to talk to other people has decreased for sure. Um, so about that, uh, how has your family dynamic changed since March 2020? Or uh, have you, like many families, resumed eating out and having family gatherings like somewhere else, apart from like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, that you guys used to go to the beach a lot? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, definitely we're being more cautious in in traveling i know for for myself i uh before i go visit my family i try to you know get tested and and make sure that i'm not positive or i'm not taking something to my my parents who are older um you know we all have different immune systems so i think uh, we we're definitely having more cautious in in how we get together and i mean we, we just kind of immediate family so we don't we don't get together in more than than six or or seven people. So that is something that uh, it has definitely changed the way that we look at things. You know, we're more cautious at washing our hands and making sure that we have everything clean and uh, that we're taking precautions when we do go out and um, get groceries. Um, my, my family doesn't really go out and like go to restaurants much. We typically just hang out at home and um, cook something at home, do some carne asada or you know, some something in the weekend. So that's just helped that's have helped a lot. I mean, closing of restaurants and things hasn't really affected much of our routine and just because um, it's a typical thing to, to um, get together at home. Um, so since you mentioned that, like you have family at the Rio Grande Valley, um, how much have you traveled as of this year to see your family? This um, year, since the pandemic started, mm -hmm. and what are your means of travel? Uh, my main uh, means of travel is uh, by vehicle, so I usually drive there. Um, uh, let me see. We, I've probably gone to visit them a few times. I recently just came back to, from visiting them, and uh, so I'm gonna say probably since all this started, I've gone to visit them around four times now. Um, did you feel you had to self quarantine after traveling? Uh, not, not really. I mean, uh, I, I usually don't go out at home and the only, the only times that I actually go out is for work and I, I get tested before I travel. So then I will travel to visit my parents and it's, I go directly to my parents and I know they're really cautious about where they go out and you know, and, and cleaning everything. And so then I just go straight back, back, uh, back home. So I haven't felt the need to, to quarantine. Um, but I, but I definitely have taken precautions to make sure that, that we're all healthy. Okay. Um, well, since you go between the Rio Grande Valley and Austin, uh, can you tell me if you think, uh, there's a difference in how people between the two regions react to COVID? Yes, definitely. I mean, there's there's a big difference. Uh, the, the, the RGV is, uh, it's, uh, I, would, I would say it's smaller compared to the central, uh, I mean, the metro area of, of Austin. It's a big city. Um, there's definitely more influence of, uh, of um, of the people there because there's we have more people here and um there's there's uh, 
uh, it is the capital of Texas as well. So there's definitely, uh, I feel like the, the, the eye is always on top of, of the city, right? Just make sure how, how it's managing through all this pandemic and um, UTRGB or RGB, sorry. It's, um, it's um, the, the people there, I feel like they're taking their precautions as well. Um, but um, I don't know if it's maybe because it's a smaller region, um, I haven't heard much from news from there um, as much as I've heard from from the Austin area. Um, and which region do you think has a better respect for social distancing, and why? I would I would probably say uh, and again this is just my my limited view from what I I I see in, in the news and um, I always see. You know, in the news, how there's people who are still going out at certain swimming spots here in Austin, and you know they haven't been uh, wearing their face coverings and things like that. And so I've heard that a lot here. Maybe because I'm I'm locally here, so um, compared to to the RGV, um, uh, the times that I have been there and the times that I see news, for the most part, they seem to be handling. Um, the precautions well um, I've gone um, on the road as far as on the road I feel like it's it's it has changed a little bit just as far as traffic but um, yeah that's I guess that would be my limited view of that uh, well which region do you think is less educated about COVID based on what you've seen Yeah, I I think that's a really that's a good question. I would I wouldn't really know. I think I think a lot of the education that comes from it um, depends on on what what is it that we're using to to learn from it. Um, either we're using the news or we are actually going and going um, by our own means and searching it online and trying to learn more about what it is. Um, based on the resources that we are having provided provided for us, um, I I would really, it is again this is my this is just my my limited opinion, but I would think I would think Austin, the central Texas area, in the sense of because it's they're definitely more aware of the complications from it because it's a bigger city. There's more people. Um, I would imagine that based on the on on the resources that are being provided and how often they talk about the coronavirus i would imagine that they would be more educated in a sense um but again that's my my limited opinion of that i think uh i agree with you because um uh, as of right now the rgv is it's a hot spot for um and it's it's considered nationally a hot spot for covid 19 um and, and yeah, like Austin's doing a lot better than than before. But over here, like uh, we we did really bad and then well, like the the cases went down. But right now we're spiking up again. So there's definitely something uh, more we can do, I guess. Um, anyways, uh, so as you mentioned in the pre-interview, you have some close friends who tested positive for COVID. Uh, one one of whom, unfortunately, an elderly passed away. Can you share with me this story? Yeah, um, this elderly or el or older gentleman, um, I knew him through through uh, church services. You know, I, I, I've gone to church for most of my life. And um, he was one of the, uh, when I was a, a youth, uh, he was one of the, the youth leaders that would help us out a lot. And um, unfortunately, yes, I heard of the news that he had uh, contracted COVID-19 and um, for the most, for, for as, as far as what I knew, he was a pretty healthy uh, adult and, and he had, I think, the typical complications that are, are pretty common sometimes to our Latino community of, you know, diabetes and high blood pressure and all those things. And it's unfortunate that this, this uh, pre- uh, existing conditions sometimes can make coronavirus um, the complication from coronavirus even even worse or in this case uh, fatal right so 
it's definitely been a, a an experience for for us and everybody who knew him because uh, we often saw cases on TV, right? And people who have gotten it and people who have passed away. But it's definitely the perspective changes a lot when that happens to someone that is that you know or that um, that is close to to your family. As far as the other people that I that I've known here in the area that have gotten um, tested positive for coronavirus, uh, the other ones that I've known of, um, they they quarantined in their homes and they had symptoms. Some were pretty severe, some weren't severe, and they they eventually were able to get tested again and 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 uh, tested negative after after you know, quarantine for a while and after dealing with the symptoms. Uh, so you also mentioned before you had some family members who lost jobs due to the pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit more about what they worked on and how long they have not been working? Yeah, so um, some of the family members that, that were laid off, um, they used to work for uh, big uh, chemical plants and the, the work there, a lot of people work pretty close together and, you know, it's, it's a job that is a physical, a physical nature. So they they have to be moving around and, and working with other people there. Um, I think those are the first, some of the first jobs that kind of went away or, or, or closed down because of this due to the nature of how close together uh, people work there. Um, they probably have been without a job for a few months now, I want to say um, maybe April, mid-April or late April. Uh, and they're still being, I mean, they have consistently been looking for other jobs and found some opportunities. But for the most part, as, as far as we having a high number of cases still um, in the area, I think they're still kind of struggling trying to to find something that would that would stick around and and provide a good source of income. Let's see, um, so oh, so now uh, I'm gonna ask you a few questions uh, about like your work and, and what you do. Um, so as you mentioned in our pre-interview, you are first responder responder at, at Austin, Texas. Um, I'd like to talk about how your job's daily routine has been affected. Uh, just to start off, how long have you worked as a first responder? So I've been uh, working as a first responder for close to four years now. Four years? Yeah. Uh, how does your day go about, like, your daily routine, like, since morning until you get home? Like, what do you do? Yeah, definitely. Um, so... The, the the normal routine, you know, it depends on on kind of what what shift you're working. Um, for the most part, I think a normal what a normal day would be is, um, um, you know, clock in, um, using your your radio, and then um, go out and 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 do patrols and respond to calls and um, and work any any crashes that that may be part of the area where where you're assigned during that day um i think that's that's kind of like the normal thing that we usually encounter you know in this kind of this line of duty there's never such a thing as a normal day but that is the closest to normal that you would the, the basic things you were you would encounter um it has changed um in a way due to the pandemic in in the sense that we have to be more careful than usual uh, to make sure that we wear our, our masks and that we are being we're aware of where we're going and, and, and the people who are encountering to make sure that we're not coming into close contact with anyone that may potentially have the virus. So then your working hours increase due to, to COVID-19? Yes, definitely. Um, how have your safety procedures changed as of last year, 2019, and today in 2020? I think definitely uh, the way that it has dramatically changed is the way that we, that we, 
Okay, I will get it. The way that we have, um, I think I, as far as cleaning our hands and doing those kind of things has definitely changed. And, you know, we, we try to be more, um, Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, I think I cut off for a little bit there, but uh, okay. yeah, so the, the way they has changed from the 2019 year to this year, I, I mean, I think definitely, you know, keeping our hands clean and being aware of where we're at and uh, who are we encountering? I think that has, that has been the the main change that we have um, uh, been facing uh, for this year compared to last year is that we are definitely more aware and we are looking for more information as far as uh, um, the people that we're encountering to make sure that we're not coming across a potential um, even riskier um, situation with people that we that we come in contact with. Um, well, like as a first responder, like, I'm pretty sure you guys, like, have to uh, do a lot of meetings. Like, uh, how does that work now? Like, uh, how do you guys, like, get together and have meetings now? Yeah, so a lot of the, the ways that we that we used to meet has changed to, to doing it virtually, right? I mean, um, there's... Uh, they have definitely utilized the resources that we have. You know, we have Zoom and we have all the other uh, ways to be able to, to get that done. Um, they, they definitely use that to the benefit of keeping people safe and uh, li limiting the, the, the contact that we have with, with other groups, um, uh, especially when it comes to doing training or, or doing uh, other type of types of meeting. Um, and you guys have to train a lot, right? Like you, you guys have trained protocols and safety procedures. Uh, do you virtually train as well, or? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we uh, we virtually train as well. Mm, can you give me an example of how the training works? Yeah, so I mean, the difference that it would be between that and the other would be that uh, we usually sign up for training and then we go into. Um, depending who is going to offer the training we go in person and we we uh we go through the classroom training or the hands-on training depending what we actually are doing that day um the difference in between that and, and now is that we do the same thing we just sign up for it and and if it's if it's uh a training that can be offered um through through uh online or, or virtual virtually then uh, it works the same way you know we find a place where we have access to to a computer or a means to be able to uh, join the class and and we get it done that way um, there's definitely some trainings that we can definitely do um, online and virtually and there's some trainings that that have to be done in, in person but those for the most part have been having canceled or postponed due to to uh, the recommendations from um, from our chain of command or from uh, local health professionals. Um, so, so do you believe uh, your department is taking all safety measures to take care of its employees? Um, and has like any coworker tested positive for the COVID? Um, yes, for the first question, I definitely, I definitely believe that they're doing their, their very best to, to, uh, to keep us safe and and um, to provide a safety as a safe environment for everyone who's who comes to work. As far as someone in um, directly that I know that I know that I work with that has tested positive, I have not. But there's definitely been people in within the department that have um, tested positive, but not in in close proximity. Um, and so the year 2020 was. Uh, not only a year of pandemic, but of international level protests for Black Lives Matter. Uh, you being in the front lines of protecting your community while risking contracting COVID-19, uh, what went through your head? 
I think the main thing that that went through our heads when when we were we we're thinking of, about all these things is uh, we definitely want to continue to do our job, um, but the that um, the awareness that we have to keep now even even higher of um, keeping you know wearing our mask and and making sure that we stay in a good safe uh, distance from from people. Um, uh, that has been probably the main thing that has been in our in our minds. How can we do continue to do our our um, our job and keeping our community safe while doing our very best to keep ourselves and our families safe too, um, you know, wearing those masks and taking the, the, the precautions uh, necessary to, to limit the exposure to that. And so, I mean, every morning you'd wake up getting ready to face the world. Um, how did you mentally prepare to take on a global pandemic and a national protest? So I think I think I think that's a that's a good question um, because that's something that is definitely part of every day and definitely part of every time before we go into work. Right, we we have to think about those things and we have to we have to come uh, uh, come to our to 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 work right, prepare mentally um, in, in those areas. I think for me for myself, I you know I I, I try to always keep in my mind that. What we're doing is for the benefit of of um, the communities to keep them safe, and t- taking the the new perspective of not coronavirus added to that, I think it's the focus is still the same: is to to do our best to continue to do our job in that aspect, which is keeping them safe from this from this coronavirus and this pandemic, um, by us ourselves taking the precautions that that we that we can take. Um, well, for the most part, like it, it does take a toll, like, uh, uh, mentally, I guess, physically as well. Um, uh, cause me as a student, like, uh, it's really difficult, like not being able to be in class and in person and, and like just being in that, like, uh, trying to, I guess, quarantine from the rest of the world. And it, it, it does like, it does stress, um. So what what do you, have you done to manage stress due to the pandemic as a first responder? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, <laughs> given the nature of the job, it's already a stressful job, right? Mm-hmm. And now adding the, 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 this worldwide pandemic, I think it's, it's definitely added to some of the stress that, that comes with that. I, I think, I think for us and for just anyone who, um, who is dealing directly with this, uh, you know, other first responders and nurses and teachers and um, doctors. And, you know, uh, I think I think something to always keep in mind is that, um, you know, stay positive. And, and you know, I myself, uh, I'm, I'm religious, right? So I definitely believe that there's, there's divine help that has been help, um, keeping us um, positive and keeping us uh, focused on, good days that that will come eventually right so i think i think mentally you know good sleeping having a good night of sleep and and doing our best to keep ourselves and our immune systems um, strong uh, working out and eating right i think this goes a long way uh, when facing this this pandemic that we that we sometimes know so little about yeah um so what are the roles do you do apart from working as a first responder like I, I know you're, you're, you were telling me you're a father, right? So. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, all the roles I would say. I mean, I, I am a father and I am a husband, and um, those are those are my main roles, you know, to to fulfill before anything else. And um, and during this pandemic, that's that has taken a toll too, right? There's a lot of stress that that comes to to our families based on on all these uh, social distancing and, and, and changes that have, that we haven't dealt with in, in, for a long time, at least in not, not in my lifetime, right. It's, it's happened before to, to the world, but um, not, not when I was, I was here, <laughs> but um, I am a uh, part of my, I'm really involved in, in the, in the church that we, that we go to. And um, we, that's taking a, um, a definitely a turn on that too, because um, the way that we used to gather and, and kind of worship together has changed. Hello? Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so how has your, uh, has your role of a father been affected during this pandemic? Um, as a father, I think, um, you know, we, we used to go out and, and go to the parks and we used to be, uh, really, really involved in going to parks and just kind of going out with, with friends and meeting in groups with their kids. And I think that's, has definitely taken a turn, uh, in there, but, um, as far as we have to, as a father, I think I have to, <laughs> we have to become more creative with how we can keep our children kind of entertained at home and, and continue to um, provide the educational side of, of things to, um, in our, you know, sometimes in our limited, limited resources that we have at home. Um, so in your daily routine, uh, you must stay in shape to, to be more effective, uh, um, to, like, I guess to, like for your job, uh, what challenges did you face trying to stay in shape due to the pandemic? I think the the obvious challenge that came with that was um, was you know the closure of, of a lot of a lot of gyms and places that um, used to to work out. Um, I mean, it, just in that aspect, I think it, it's just having gyms that, that closed or or limited their hours and and, and things like that. But um, I mean, we have to still find a way to stay healthy and active and, you know, we still have to, to work out in some way or other. So that has just switched to doing that at the gym. Now it's now it's at home or um, um, going out for a run and, and utilizing uh, uh, the ways that we can in, that are still safe for the community. Um, and lastly, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, as a first responder, what advice would you give to the community? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think if 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 there could be take anything could be taken uh, from this interview, um, that would be that. Um, I think I I, I I believe in people. You know, I I, I definitely see in, uh, that we are really resilient, and that there's there's when things like this happen. Unfortunately, things like this happen. Um, that there, a lot of good comes from, from how the people react to things. Um, I think, if anything, just to tell the community that to stay, stay positive, stay healthy, to do their what they what they can do um, to help their families and and keep themselves uh, healthy and 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 away from this, you know, this coronavirus. But other than that, is you know, know that. Together we can overcome a lot of a lot of hard hardship and a lot of a lot of things that that um, that have come uh, to to our awareness, especially this year. I think just the best way to to always overcome something this big is to to do it together and to to always keep in mind um, that we are all all um, going through it equally. You know, there's 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 definitely uh, this pandemic is it's going um from home, home home to home so i think just staying positive and, and knowing that we are all uh, in somewhere or the other uh facing some trial through because of this and yeah just just uh reach out to people that may need help and even just a phone call because of you know the social distancing and uh, just making sure that we think do we still connect with our families and, and the community in the ways that we that we can um, well, before we finish the interview, uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions um, to see like where you stand. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in your city and county? Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, it, it could be easy to kind of Monday morning quarterback a situation, especially mm -hmm. of this nature. There's a lot of high emotions that run through, through, through this topic, uh, especially right now. But, um, I, I, 
I think, you know, I want to give the benefit of the doubt that, you know, they're doing their best with, with what they have and the resources they have. Uh, but there's definitely areas of improvement that, that, um, that um, I hope they, they address and they, they continue to improve. Uh, what about uh, as a state as a whole, are you satisfied with the state response uh, to COVID-19 led by government Abbott? Um, I think that, you know, again, I think, I think they're doing, they're trying to do their best with what they have. And, uh, um, again, I, I, I do believe there's areas of improvement, uh, but it's, it's easier, easier said, said than done, right. To, mm -hmm. to be able to do, uh, those things, but, um, definitely there's always things that we can improve. And, and I think, uh, this pandemic being so new and, 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 uh, and taking a lot of people by by surprise, I think it's 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 uh, it has to be an ongoing conversation and ongoing uh, um, um, experience to to continue to change and, and mold so to be able to address it in in a, in the proper way. Mm -hmm. uh, what about nationally? Uh, are you satisfied with the national response to COVID nineteen led by uh, President Trump and his administration? Um, I, you know, there's things, there's things that I, I, I think they're done well, and, uh, there's definitely areas that I think they need improvement. Um, uh, if you had the power to respond to COVID-19, what would you do differently, if anything? That's a good question. Uh, again, <laughs> you know, it's easier to Monday morning quarterback, uh, something, but, uh, I think I think just uh, people in, in general, right? They just they just deserve the the transparency of uh, of what is going on and just being being uh, completely transparent to to if something is you know it's is is bad and like this pandemic and and we need to know and we need to take precautions. I think the best way to to do that is to to simplify the way things are communicated and. Uh, and being transparent and straightforward with what's going on. That way uh, people can, can be able to react properly. But uh, um, again, that's in my limited knowledge of that. I think that that's something that, that would help. Uh, and this is a special year in our national democracy because it's a presidential voting year. Did you vote? And if so, did you notice or do anything different because of COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, yes. So yes, I, I did vote. And uh, uh, yes, uh, there's there's definitely things in our mind, especially, you know, being being in part of this this nation that COVID-19 has been in our minds since since it started. And I think I think the way that we have uh, that we have uh, thought about about politics and about other other things that influence our daily lives, uh, COVID-19 has definitely been on our on top of the list to to consider and to to uh, to know how to better respond to it next time. Hopefully, not next time that happens, but if they, it is that we that we know how to react properly. Uh, lastly, is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID nineteen that I have not asked about? Uh, let me think. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the only thing I would, I would, I can think of that I would like to share is just, uh, you know, I, I, in my, you know, a personal um, uh, perspective and, and view, I, I've seen that um, there's been a greater need for, um, for using our mental health resources and 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 you know applying mental health first aid you know to to our loved ones and to ourselves uh, especially through this pandemic you know a lot of, a lot of the normal things that we we usually tend to, to do uh, getting together with other people family or friends um, going out you know and has been limited and and I think uh, in, in a way or another it can affect the mental health of our community. Um, just, just really, really being aware and just uh, understanding that 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 we we all need 
uh, to a certain point, you know, helping that aspect. And it, it's okay to have that help. Yeah, definitely. Um, so no, uh, these are all my questions. Um, um, I finished with my questions. Um, lastly, uh, I just want to thank you like for your time uh, and for giving me the opportunity to interview you and I guess to form a part of, of, of this, uh, this project. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, be part of this too. I, I think when you initially were talking to me about, you know, uh, this being a part of uh, such a great part of the community, I think it's a great thing uh, for you to uh, do this, this uh, type of thing and, and assignments for school. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.